Hi, my name's Relevant, and my friend here is Tape Server. Tape Server is a computer I threw together out of spare parts to support the use of my Quantum LT04 tape drive. But unfortunately, Tape Server has some irreconcilable differences that I need to sort out, and today I'm sorting those issues out. Tape Server is getting an upgrade because I bought some purpose components just for this build, and namely, this oddball Intel embedded style system. Peeping inside our innards here, we have, uh, you know, an old low performing AMD Phenom quad core 9600 processor. That's the first quad core that ever came out. And even though it has more than enough horsepower for the job, its biggest problem is it consumes 100 watts standing still. And then once I actually fire up that tape drive, we're burning up to 140 watts. I do not like that. One might debate how often do I use the thing? Well, not very often, like once a month, but it runs for a minimum four hours at a time. That's how long it takes to fill a tape. Now, if I actually have to recover a tape, it takes like twice as much time. Now, I don't know if that's a flaw with the system or if that's just how the tape drive works, but nevertheless, long hours this guy runs, burning a lot of hydro. Now, this is further exacerbated by this old power supply, an Antec True Power 2.0, 550 watts. It's a good solid power supply, but this is like pre all that 80 plus uh, rigmarole we got going on now so it's not very energy efficient another problem is it has is uh, I'm booting off this 512 gig SSD which is actually intended for my Atomos recorder so I kind of need to recover that component now naturally being the team red connoisseur that I am I went shopping around for some AMD parts unfortunately given their history nothing old AMD is worth the money so that's out and well, Ryzen, of course, I knew Ryzen would do the job. I kind of tested this rig with a 2200G at one point, but Ryzen is super popular now. I would have been looking at like 150 bucks used to score myself a 2200G, and the original retail is 139.99. They're actually going up in price. That, and it's hard to find a board. You can pretty much only buy them new, and the used ones aren't much cheaper. And then of course, you also have to buy RAM. At least that's gone down in price. I scored, could have scored eight gigs for about 30 bucks. But you know, I decided to take a more conservative approach. And while I was shopping around, I discovered this thing called an embedded board. And there were some very interesting options, having little Little, little tiny laptop type processors on there only burning about 10 15 watts their horsepower would have been equivalent to the 9600 at least the affordable ones that I wanted ultimately I gravitated away from them but what I ended up finding was this and what's this you might ask this is a complete bare bones system motherboard processor RAM cooler power supply even a skeletonized micro itx chassis the only thing that is missing is an ssd now i haven't got much use for this power supply or this chassis at this time but uh i think it can come in handy later i already have an idea of using this chassis for a itx build for the uh, shed when i'm finally setting up workshop in there so i'm gonna rip down on this thing and we're gonna take a closer look at it hmm, nice copper chunk there bud all right, so what is it that we have here exactly? Well, this is an Aeon EMB B75A Micro ITX motherboard. And some of the selling points of this guy is, for one, it's got all the modern amenities. It's got two gigabit LANs, two USB 3.0, two USB 4.0, three HDMI and a VGA. Yeah, this apparently can run three monitors at once. It has three SATA ports, one of which is SATA 3 or SATA 600. The other two are SATA 2, so that's a little bit lacking there, but at least it has one SATA 3 for a good boot drive. It's sporting an Intel Core i3-3220 processor which, you know, is the runt of the litter and rather old, but more than enough horsepower than what I'm gonna need. And it's got a TDP of I forget because sometimes I forget things right as soon as I start filming. I'll just insert it right here. And that's significantly lower than the something like 110 watts that the Phenom's rated for. It came with four gigabytes of DDR3 RAM, which is the minimum that I need. And that's what the other system had. So I know that's gonna work for me, but this becomes a further selling point because it just so happens. I got a nice eight gig set of some XMS3 Corsair RAM, bringing it up to something resembling modern spec. 
Now some of the tiny embedded boards, they had limited PCI Express functionality. In this case, this guy's got a full 16X PCI Express 3.0 slot, and that's gonna run our interface card for our tape drive just fine. We've got some USB 3.0 header right here, and these USB 2.0 headers, but they look smaller than normal. Yeah, you know, they are not standard. I might not be able to connect. That might be a problem, because I do want a little bit of front USB for this guy. But assuming this is standard size, I, I, I have a hack for that. And then another selling point is, well, if you know me, you know I'm a water cooling enthusiast, specifically open loop. AIOs are not in my vocabulary, but they are this time. Because it just so happens, I have this scrap Alienware AIO still in good functioning order in my inventory, and I only have the Intel mounts for it. So I'm like, well, hey, I can water cool this thing and put it on par with the rest of my systems. Assuming, of course, this mount is compatible. Oh no, can we, uh... Oh, this is beefy. Is this even gonna work for me? I'm not liking these odds, sir. Uh, these post holes don't line up, but they can switch around. Uh-oh. How many different freaking mounts did Intel make? Now I see one of the common complaints against them. Yeah, no, these mount posts aren't mounting up. This is an LGA something something that's not this. Uh, well, I'm gonna have to use some trickery because it's not like I can't make things fit. This base plate, you know, does have these uh, de holes right here. So it's just a little bit of creativity and I think I'm gonna be able to get that on there. This thing's got the stock goo on it. I don't think that cooler's ever been taken off before today. Oh yeah, no problem, bud. I'll be able to get this pupper mounted up using the pulse that came off the stock cooler. So, problem solved. Just need some nice washers. Do I have some nice washers about that size? How much you want to bet I don't because I love you, right? Oh, those are no good. I need them for wider holes than that. Ah, yes, after consulting the hardware department for a Colonel's secret combination of herbs and spices, my personal Colonel, me as that is, we have discovered the caramel milk secret. And there we just have some, you know, strange washers that I purchased for a project that didn't work out. But now this thing's going to slip rather nicely onto there. Now, I got distracted, where were we again? Oh yeah, I was introducing this build and the hardware I'm gonna be using. So that's the motherboard processor RAM. Yay! Further solving on this problem. I picked up an EVGA 650 Gold. 650, not because I need that amount of power, but because, you know, it's hard to buy a power supply that's less than that nowadays, especially when you're picking it up used on the eBay and some previous enthusiast is selling off his old crap. But this is a good healthy power supply and with that gold rating, it's gonna bring those wattage numbers down for us. Also, the modularity, well, it's gonna freaking clean up that wiring for us because that, uh, you know, ketchup and mustard splattered all around that beast kind of made it look a little bit more old school than I care for. And then of course, to reclaim the drive, that's a Samsung 840 Pro, 128 gig. That's all we need to boot it off. All right, before we go tearing this pupper apart, I wanna run a few tests on it just to have the ability to compare the two. So, you know, I have this ancient, oh, well, no, that's normal because it's old. It's an ancient benchmark, CPU Bench 2003 uh, beta version 1.5, and it has some very basic benchmarks. It's gonna, you know, it's no standard by today's standards, but it's gonna give us a, a number in which to compare the two rigs. And it starts off with some Photoshoppy type tests, goes through some number crunching. Ha, uh, yes, software ray tracing. Note the 2.91 frames a second. At 640 by 480. It's funny, I never heard of this when I used this benchmark back in the day, but now everybody knows what ray tracing is, right? All right, we have Sonic the Hedgehog, Ginger, Waifu, Best Girl here, spinning around at 20 frames a second, roughly. And then that's the last visual one. We're just gonna skip to the end. All right, bust arson out the graph of results here. 7335, which is dismal because apparently it's not faster than an old Pentium 4. But nevertheless, all we care is to see this particular number right here. There are other numbers like ALU FPU, FPU single double precision ray tracing RAM. We also got that test run at a time of two minutes, 29, 37 seconds. So that's two minutes and 30 seconds. We got some good old fashioned Cinebench R15 here. Oh, that's everybody's classic favorite. 
Oh boy, we might be here a while. Look at that little block down in their corner, trying so hard. Okay, that took an excruciating four minutes and five seconds for a result of a whole 163. I don't think we've ever seen numbers that low as long as this program's been used on YouTubes. Okay, so I think we got all the data we need from this old beast. We can tear her apart now. But, you know, before we get uh, too into things, I am going to test out the new build, as is. All oh, this little cutie in its tight little package here. And we're gonna go ahead and press the power button and see what happens. Oh, she makes some noises there. Now, even though we don't have a four pin here, it's definitely working. Seems to be running cool for now. And it's pretty quiet, like this fan here isn't really spinning too hard. And this fan here, I've noticed it maybe ramp up and down. Uh, for all intents and purposes, this is a modern spec power supply. Heck, I even think I've seen that fan turned off at some points. Now I got a fresh copy of Windows 10 installed on this Paparino, even though it looks almost exactly identical to the last one. I've set it up the same way with the same software. So let's go ahead and <laughs> run the benchmark on this guy and see what happens. Oh boy. Oh boy, you blink and you miss it. Oh, look at those th things just flying. Now, to be fair, this is like a 212 era processor, I think, whereas the Phenom 2 is a 2008 era processor. So even though it's Intel versus AMD right now, it's just, this processor's way newer. Hey, holy frick, look at her go. 60 frames a second. Oh, 40,609. That is just devastating compared to the Phenom. That's just, boom, just blowing it out of the water there. RAM score, 19 gigabytes a second. Total time, 49 seconds. Okay, <laughs> and that green bar just towers over the other results. Just brrr, knocked it down. This is just, never mind. This processor is obviously way better. So let's hit up some Cinebench now. Might as well. All right, let's go. Run. Already off to a great start, and this is looking way faster than the Phenom. And if you remember what I told you about the other system, how much wattage it was pulling, it's worth mentioning that while running this benchmark, we're clocking in but 41 watts. 40 watts under load. Instantly shaving 100 watts. Now, I haven't got the tape drive running yet, but uh, significantly higher performance, significantly less wattage. Exactly the effect I was going for. Now, the Phenom's plenty good enough to run this tape application, so this is going to own it. No problem. And done. At 2 minutes 19 seconds, literally half the time, we're going to score a 295. Still not high numbers, but the last one was 163. And I think we're done here, benchmarking and testing this system out. And it's pretty good, as is. Y you know, you could buy this just like this, and boom, you got yourself a computer. A computer that I accidentally hit the power button on while doing that. Either way, we're done here. We can start getting on the building. Now, to further complicate things, we're not going to be using that Cooler Master case anymore. We're going to be using this Inwin case. This was a case that I do believe was made by Inwin back before they were cool, but you know, they were still making quality cases. I was quite impressed with this case. Now it's not much different than the Cooler Master case in its form and layout, but it's slightly more accommodating to certain needs. You see, the Cooler Master case has a front 120 and a rear 92. If we're gonna use this AIO, we need a rear 120 which is what this one has, and it has a front 92. So we're gonna be able to use that uh, same fan set, but you know, be able to get our CPU cooling going out the case there. Right now, that's a Ryzen 200 GE, nothing special. <laughs> Eight gigabytes single channel, Corsair MP300, PCI Express 2X NVMe SSD, and that's about it. This is but a simple mild manner Netflix build, and you can see, <laughs> She's passively cooled, which you can do nowadays. If you ain't gaming on it, you don't need much cooling. So she is named the Hushbox because she's quiet. Did I just assume it's gender? So I gotta start pulling this guy apart now. <clears throat> there I go again. And prepping this case for the grand install. 
Ah, uh, yes, invoking hopes and prayers, as one can only assume that this is some sort of standardized form factor that will actually be compatible with this case. Let us see now if holes line up the way we need them to. Indeed, we have line upage. We are going to be good. And one of my first impressions of this board was that this guy right here was uncharacteristically close. I'm not used to seeing it that close, so I questioned whether or not the interface would actually line up. Ah, indeed it does. Perfect. That's all the computer we need in the world to do what I'm doing. And it is going to be empty and gaping in there. Well, because we can't really use the front panel connections of this guy, uh, we have the option to disconnect them all together to make for a cleaner install. Ah, uh, yeah, let's try not to lose track of these if I ever want to repurpose this build again. Oh, we don't need the PC speaker either because that popper built onto the board beeps something fierce. Like, that was the loudest PC speaker I've ever heard in my entire history of PC speakering. Yeah, she's, uh, she's empty now, bud. We're gonna have to, uh, give on her. I am in the planning stages because it takes a while to figure out what trickery I'm going to use to get everything put the way I want it and the way I like it. It's gonna get rather busy over here as you got so much connectivity going up over into here. See in here we got the AIO bundle ready to go. I strategically stealth taped the wire along the back of the tube so that when it's actually in place it's going to look clean AF. Meanwhile, this fan has been specially modified with an actual fan pass-through, which means power goes in, and then I soldered on this connector so that the uh, 12 volt, the PWM, can pass back out of it. Now, this uh, pump uh, doesn't have PWM, and it's quiet enough at 12 volt, I I'm, I'm allowing it to run at that speed. Meanwhile, the general vicinity that the uh, fan connector is in is going to be perfectly right there, so it's going to be a nice hide. So that works out rather perfectly. The fan's PWM controlled, and then the 12 volt could pass right through to the pump, making it one complete unit. As mentioned, there's a lot going on over in here. We're not quite done yet, but you know, I don't use zap straps, I use twist ties because you're always taking them on and off and on and off. And then we have the typical corner of the board tie down there managing this main trunk. And I got this uh, metal piece of Meccano bit holding down these wires going into there. On the front, more pro gamer moves with the inverted SSD. And I managed to find this nook and cranny here to feed the SATA cable and the front panel IO because it had to go up top board, not bottom board. We got these cables strapped down here, but it also doubles the other way around, strapping the cable from the other side to keep it cooperative. And then of course, these guys are strapped in there nice too. Strapping, strapping, strapping. That's what it's all about. And then eventually, you get cables that aren't going anywhere on you. Well, we gotta start loading drives here. Or wait, oh, the fan. Let's put this grill on it, just to make it look pretty. Look pretty. Ah, oh, we're dealing with some pretty tight tolerances here, people. We have the uh, arse end of the law here, bumping uglies at the general periphery connections in such a way that uh, it's actually quite tight. And we got a bunch jammed up into here because, you know, we just needed that one dirty Molex to connect these two drives together. And yeah, it gets jammed. Uh, most of it is right up. There's a nice gap in there to fit some cables. And also just enough for the main power trunk to tuck in behind the drive itself. So, well... What we have here is probably pretty much the cable management complete. For the most part, there's a general cavernous echo going on down on here. <laughs> but up here, it's just everything's in the top 40. Well, we just gotta button her up a bit and install the AIO. Oh boy, is this even gonna fit all in here? Yeah, yeah it will. Gotta plug in that power first. Okay, now to get this guy into place. We should probably schmoo the goo first, right? Yeah, I think so. But to dollop. Okay, this is gonna be one of the trickiest parts of the operation here. Cause we gotta line up three improvised screws while seating this. Oh boy, this is tight. That's one. That's two. Hey, okay, that's a problem now. Cause that has to kind of shimmy in there a certain way. Okay, I hit my mark with that one. Now I just have to get this last one into place. Hey, don't you start screwing around like that. All right. Carefully. Easy. Got it. All right. We have a 
<laughs> we have a Bailey-and-wear cooler on this now. Oh, that's jokes, bud. That's jokes. Now, how about our interface card? Oh, of course. It's funny installing such a fanciful device in here. All right. Oh, there's just one more cable left to connect here. And that's, uh, you know, Squidward here. Well, let's just uh, shove a little strap in there. That's an uglier one. That's okay. Uh, we just want to secure this down some way somehow, and we're good. All right. This metal strap here should keep it cooperational. Noise. Noise, bud. Noise. I think this thing's just about done. Now I have to rip ass. Oh, boy. And there it is. It's a much more professional looking system in this rig. And my hack for getting front USB was to throw this card reader in there. All right. Are we ready for the grand unveiling of Tape Server 2.0? Press that beautiful bean button. Uh-oh. Did I forget to... Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Listen to that AIO grind. Oh, the SAS controller is initializing. This is good news. And it has found the drive. And the quietness has settled in here. Yes, we have a gentle breeze coming in the front. Hey, right. and that's not spun up too fast. We're getting an incorrect boot media error. Whoa, this popper's detecting every friggin' slot on the card reader and it's dog. Disable all these. You just boot from that Sammy and we're good. There we go. We have ball spin. Well, isn't that just a cute little tape server now? Look at that, with its little glowing red LEDs. I don't know that I have an application that's gonna tell me how hot this pupper's running, so I guess we're SOL for that for now. But I gotta go ahead and put the cover on this. Oh, I got the snorkel installed. That's not gonna go on there. <laughs> no, you remember case snorkels? They're a good idea back when we still ran conventional coolers. Probably still are a good idea if you're running a conventional cooler. Okay, well, we have one uh, open hole here, so it's too bad we can't make this nice bezel still hang out here. Or can we? Ah, yes, we can. Good. That uh, cleans up the look, along with this price tag blocking this hole, which was for uh, advanced thermal management in another build that I did in here. So now, basically, what we got to be doing is uh, testing on this thing, sir. So I have a tape here. Now, let's, for the first time, put a tape into this machine. Make sure that's all working. It's not the quietest build, but um, I think I can hear that fan or that motor noise. Not that I'm gonna hear it over that tape drive, right? All right, this tape's mounted. Let's see what happens if we log into dashboard. There it all is, tape drive, right where I left it. Tape with tape stuff on it. Now let's, uh, let's try the hot swap with this machine. Oh, the prompt popped up. Choose what happens. Open files. There's the files. Those are some previously printed projects. Uh, we need to find one that's not so big so we can do a test burn. Smallest one I got is the Garnet one, 56 gigs. All right, now we have disabled automatic updates on this machine because it's um, what I consider to be an ASIC. Once it's running, we don't want anything to screw with it. And it's not like we're putting it online. So let's actually test on this thing now. Click here to add the files false so you want to back up. All right, grab this one here. Make sure our tape backup settings are correct. Yep, okay. So uh, let's run and see what happens. And go. Sounds like it's having no problem. Watch it works better on this machine. Has this light been blinking? Yeah, okay. We got everything hooked up right. Oh, I haven't tested the reset switch. Well, I ain't testing that now. Okay, it's doing things a little bit slow. Let's look at task manager. Memory, 1.4 gigs. Yeah, it doesn't use a whole heck of a lot. 6.9 gigs because just over a gig is assigned to the video card, which is great. It means we're going to get that smooth computing experience. Our CPU, yeah, it's using 14% to do this. Really? Yeah, uranium backup, 10, 11%. Our speed isn't friggin' cranking up there. We're still running in a low power state. Did I mention that this processor's two core four threads? So that's a sweet spot. Now let us check our power consumption. Remember, the last build was 140 watts during a tape burn. Now we're but 68. 
65. 65 watts to burn a tape. That's up from 40 watts doing uh, stress test benchmarks. That means the hardware that I'm running here is using 30 watts between that tape drive and the uh, hard drive that I added. I also got a little bit more going on with, you know, the pump cooler and stuff, but still, we have cut our power consumption in half, and that's good. Now, considering a modern Ryzen, like a 2200G, can use as little as 25, 30 watts, going Ryzen would have only cut 10 watts off of this. So, you know what? That's a lot of extra money to pay for just 10 watts more of savings. So I think this is a happy compromise. So far, this has been a good value, especially since it's allowed me to reuse older components like that DDR3 RAM and that AIO. Oh, it did that thing. Now this process should take about 20 minutes, give or take. We will reconvene when it's done because the final part of the test is going to be pulling data back off of the drive. As we near the end, we see it uses a consistent 20, 25, 26% of the hard drive. CPU dropped down to 4%, nothing on the C drive. And this feels like it went a lot faster. At 17 minutes and 30 seconds for 56 gigs? I swear with the old build, it took like 20 minutes to do 30-ish gigs. Like, let's see what the log says. 56 gigs done in 17 minutes, 26 seconds at 3.2 gigabytes a minute. I don't think we ever really got numbers that high before. It felt like the tape drive tripped less often because I noticed it does this thing where it's, it's flowing data and all of a sudden it like stops. Feels like it has to go back a bit and continue on. I don't know what it's doing when it's doing that. Sometimes I wonder if it finds a bad spot of tape and it kind of skips over it. But on that note, I know one painful process that it did that constantly with was actually recovering data. We will close up these logs and we will go to restore. And here we're gonna grab this folder we got. Oh, and here's an interesting feature that I discovered. Restore non-existing files and restore files if they are newer than the backup files. If you select that function, you can do a partial backup. Like if you have a, a, a folder of data and like you accidentally delete a couple files out of it and then you're scratching your head, you're like, oh geez, I don't know which ones I deleted. You don't have to recover the whole project. It will do a synchronization where if you click that feature, it will just replace the files that are missing. So it saves a lot of time if you only have to do a partial recovery. So let's go ahead and uh, click this button here, restore selected items. Now, when I did this before, the tape drive felt like it tripped up a lot during the recovery process. And sometimes I wonder if that's a data flow issue. And now that we have a commercial grade, server grade, no, there it goes. And it's baffling because it does it mid file when it does this. You see that? It grabs like a few percent, then it has to like. Eh -er, eh -er, eh -er. Okay, it looks like we're still gonna have that problem, but you'd think it would be able to continuously run. Well, either way, I don't know if that's normal operation or if maybe that's tapeware that does that, or if this is the reason why I got this machine used for cheap because it has some glitches. Okay, well, this operation is identical to the way it was before, so <laughs> I don't know what to tell you there. So it took 20 minutes to pull like one four-ish, five-ish gigabyte file off the tape. So as you can see, the read speed is significantly slower, but it keeps glitching in this way where it looks like the program is crashing and then recovering. Getting data onto the tape seems easy. Getting it off the tape seems to be a pain in the arse. Either way, that read glitch is subject to controversy and it is starting to do me a concern. And that is going to have to be something that I look into. But in the meantime, for all intents and purposes, this, uh, this build was uh, successful. It's consuming less power, it's cleaner, maybe a little bit quieter, even though that rear fan's spinning a bit fast, but that's okay. On the bright side, it does look like this file we pulled off is perfectly fine. Though the funny thing we're noticing here is, uh, well, it's, it's taking quite a bit of uh, processing power to render this file, which you'd think that the video card would be doing that, but I don't know. But yeah, tape server 2.0, all done, put together. Gotta figure out if that uh, tape drive is glitching. Either way, it's still working. Maybe it's just the old tapes I'm using. Eh, 
But hey, I hope you enjoyed this. Not sure, uh, I think we're gonna be done with tape server for a while. Unless I find out some more interesting information about that glitch.